So if you have a telescope and you're looking at something that you can see as being separated, two stars in this case, then you would say that's resolved. You, you've resolved two stars. The light's coming into the telescope, you can see both stars. So when you look at you know, the Big Dipper and you see multiple stars, those are resolved because you can separate the light from the two sources. <clears throat> if it's unresolved, it'll just look like one star. Everyone, that makes sense? Yes, okay, good. Resolution is defined as lambda over d. Lambda, everyone knows what that refers to? Wavelength. Wave good, okay, d. <clears throat> Of the good, all right, we're all, we're all good here. So that's, resolution is, is very important and that equation is extremely important um, for the work that I do because um, it determines how, you know, how close in to a star can you see? How can you see little planets really close in on scales comparable to the solar system or not? That's determined by resolution. And that's where, that's where adaptive optics basically allows us to get to what a theoretical perfect telescope could do. Is, is, that's, that's the key to resolution. And just so, you know, so obvious like that. <coughs> there. there you go. This is not actually true, though, when you're looking in, you know, into the night sky on Earth with your telescope. This, this equation is not true because of seeing, which again, seems like you guys are all familiar with. But basically, seeing um, obliterates this equation and just and makes it uh, the, the size of the, of the object you're looking at basically becomes what the atmosphere is doing. Um, so this, this is not true when you're looking through the atmosphere into the night sky. That's a problem. So this creates, you know, this old saying, twinkle, twinkle, little star, it's actually bad, right? So when the star is twinkling, that's the atmosphere blurring the, star, the starlight, and it's, and it's preventing us from actually seeing the things that are around the star that we want to see, like planets and disks. So this is bad. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Kepler, have you guys all heard about Kepler, the satellite? Yes. Okay, so Kepler has shown us that basically every star has planets, on average. Every star in the galaxy, probably the universe, has planets. Um, you know, here's the star, here's a bunch of planets. Problem is, again, when we look from Earth, this is what we see. A big block. <laughs> you know, this thing is just ruining, <laughs> ruining our lives. The atmosphere just kills it. Um, if, ideally, we'd like to get rid of all this and so we can see you know, the planets around the star. So just to illustrate what seeing does, um, if you have a star and a planet like this, the light's coming from both. Okay, the planet is emitting its own light. You have Earth's atmosphere, these little pockets of turbulence in the way. And what we see is just a big block. And so the, the effect of that is even if you, have, you go to a bigger telescope, you, know, you increase you guys are talking about your 10 inches, your 10 inch diameter, <coughs> or whatever. You go to you know, 20 inches, 30 inches, it's still going to look the same. Yeah, you'll be able to see fainter things because you're collecting more light. You won't be able to resolve uh, you know, things that are close together just by increasing your, your uh, telescope diameter. So that's, that's unfortunate. And ideally, we'd like to fix that. Here's a little cartoon showing again what seeing does. So you know, the path of light basically gets all distorted on its way down to us here on Earth. Here's a star. You know, this, this is one star, and basically uh, seeing just makes a whole bunch of images of the star, which we then collect um, you know, in our eyes or you know, uh, through the telescope or our camera. Here's a little uh, uh, animation of the moon, actually. These are actual images of the moon, and you can see what seeing is doing. It's just distorting. Uh, that's, that's bad. Okay, how do we beat seeing? Um, we can go to space. Uh, we heard a little bit in the introduction about Hubble, and that's, that's great. Um, you, you get above the atmosphere, don't even have to worry about it. Only problem, it's really freaking expensive. Um, and, and also, remember going back to lambda over d in terms of resolution, because it's so expensive, you, your, your primary mirror has to be small. Hubble is, I think, 2.4, 2.5 meters. Uh, on the ground, we can go as big as we want, really. I mean, we're still going to keep doing it, but it takes a long time to get just these two and a half meters in space. There's another way called lucky imaging. Has anyone ever heard of this? Okay, so some of you have maybe. Um, it's pretty cheap. Uh, no adaptive optics or anything fancy. What you do is you just basically take lots of really short exposure images, and you kind of throw out the ones where the scene was bad, and you keep the ones where the scene was good. And so you can go from like a blurry image to a nice sharp or sharper image. That's called lucky imaging. That, that works decently well. 
Um, but it's never going to be good enough to get us, you know, to seeing little little planets around each of these stars. It's never going to happen. Lucky imagery. The best way, in my opinion, of course I'm biased, but um, the best way is really adaptive optics, and that's kind of expensive and kind of a lot of work and <coughs> kind of painful, um, but it's it's worth it in the end. I'll explain a little bit about how that works. So how it works is basically you have your star and planet in space. The light comes from the star undistorted. It enters Earth's atmosphere and gets all messed up. And uh, it hits our deformable mirror, which um, in, in the case of the telescopes that I use, the deformable mirror is the secondary mirror. So, and, and other telescopes often have their, their deformable mirror way down, you know, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh mirror. Um, there are some advantages to the way we do it. Um, which you guys can ask me about later if you want. It's getting a little technical, but so this is basically our deformable mirror. It's our secondary mirror, and basically what it's doing is it's going to bend in exactly the perfect way to remove the distortion of the light and make it a you know perfect wave. And so if you don't have adaptive <coughs> optics, you just see a blob. And if you do, um, ideally, and this by the way, this correction happens thousands of times per second. Okay, so you're, you're, you have pistons behind a flat, very thin mirror, pushing it a thousand times a second. Okay, so here's, I mentioned a little bit about uh, how the, 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 the telescopes that I use, how the adaptive optics works. So basically, here's your secondary mirror, which this is the thing that bends you know, a thousand times a second to correct for what the atmosphere is doing. We use this thing called a pyramid wavefront sensor, which is, there's only like four of them in the world. One guy can make them, and they're extremely important. Um, they actually provide the, they, they put the light in the right place for the, uh, the computers to do the wavefront sensing, which is you know, figuring out how distorted is the light, so, and, then, and then it corrects for it using this uh, pyramid wavefront sensor. And the, the result of that is you know, these two images. This is the LBT. Have you guys heard of that? Yeah? OK, it's the Large Binocular Telescope. And binocular means, yes, there are two telescopes. Um, it's a telescope I used a lot when I was a graduate student at the University of Arizona. Uh, unfortunately, it's in Arizona, which you may have heard has great night skies, but when you put a telescope on a mountain, there's trees everywhere, there's squirrels everywhere, uh, there's clouds all the time, it's raining and snowing, it's, it's actually not that not a great of sight. Um, so I might prefer Magayo, that's in Chile, and it was nice to see some, so that, you know, he was talking about his trip to Chile. Um, the, the, there's a reason that there's a lot of telescopes in Chile, it's because the night skies are spectacular. And we don't, we're not even that high. This is the LBT is at 11,000 feet. <coughs> Magio is at like 8,000 feet, and it's not even close in terms of you know how much better of the site uh, Magio is. Uh, and just to, just so you guys know, you guys know what these rings are? Yeah, yeah very good. Okay, good. Just making sure. So this is what this is what you should see if you have perfect diffraction. So this is what you know again if you're looking at a telescope, what nature wants to, us to see, but you can't see unless you have adaptive optics. Here's Magellan. There's two telescopes. They're each six and a half meters. The one I use is this one. It's so actually uh, down, you wouldn't be able to see it, but down here are the dorms and uh, the, the, the dining hall. There's excellent food. They have chefs that, that uh, live up there, or they, they rotate, but they make spectacular food. Um, and then I take the trek. I walk all the way up. It's about a 15 minute walk. It's the most exhausting walk of my life usually because it's you know you're up 8,000 feet and you know you're tired all the time because you're staying up all night. But um, it's worth it because you get to go and stay um, in this in this telescope, um, which is called the Clay Telescope. This is Bada Clay, and uh, we have two instruments um, that that are used with MAGAO. Uh, this is called VISAO. That's one instrument, and it's it's what the name implies. It's a visible camera, so you can actually do visible adaptive optics. Basically what your eyes would see you know, you, is, is what this camera provides. And at the same time, uh, we also have an infrared camera. And they both operate simultaneously. So we are very efficient when we're taking data because we can get a ton of <coughs> wavelength coverage in a single night. Here's a little movie showing what the adaptive secondary mirror does to correct for the atmosphere. And it's, it's got a, don't think, of, don't think about what it's actually showing. Just watch the patterns that, that uh, actually go by. So this is, this is not even in, this is too, still too slow. The mirror is actually correcting even faster than, than what you see here. But basically, you can see the mirror looks like turbulence. And that's because the mirror is correcting for that turbulence. So you're seeing you know, turbulence go by. And 
um, tip tilt effects, higher order effects. Uh, that's what the atmosphere is doing, you know, constantly, and the mirror is trying to correct for that and catch up all the time. Okay, so with adaptive optics, we can now see uh, planets and disks. To give you a couple uh, examples around this this star, though, which is Beta Pig. Beta Pig is about it's, it's an A star, so that's a very hot, massive star compared to our own, you know, middle A, middle of the road uh, G star. And uh, <clears throat> so this got. It's a planet, and it's actually one planet. And the reason there's two pictures of it is because it was first imaged in 2003. For six years, the, uh, the, the people that took that image just had the data, may not have gotten around to it, whatever happened, doesn't matter, but the, they actually didn't get around to publishing that first image until 2009. And then everyone said, wow, this could really be a planet. And back then, we didn't really have images of planets. And uh, so then everyone, of course, went to their telescopes, used adaptive optics to look and see if they could see it again, confirm you know, this planet discovery. And it wasn't there. So everyone was kind of like thinking, oh, this thing may be not real, or what's going on? Of course, a couple of years later, they, they took some more images, and it showed up on the other side of the star. So it had actually moved around. So we actually saw orbital motion, um, which is actually, I think, just spectacular. But you can actually see a planet going around another star, light years away. Um, so that's the story of Beta Pig. OK, so, so it's, it's hard to see these things, um, the planets, right? But it's actually easier to see these disks. And it turns out these, that, that the planets and disks are, are really intrinsically linked. And I'll, I'll go into that a little bit more. So it's easier to see these disks. And just so you guys know, debris disk, that's what we call them, it's basically like an exo Kuiper belt. So you have the star here, you have planets in a typical planetary system, you have nothing, a gap, usually because the planets clear out material, and then you have your boulders and dust. And your planets look like this, probably, Jupiter, and your dust looks like that. Okay, so it's, so it's hard to see this, it's easy to see this, believe it or not. Okay, so this is kind of like an outline. It's a cartoon version of an outline for this talk. Uh, but here's your toy planetary system. You have a star, a couple planets, and your disk. I, as, we, as I move through this talk, I'm gonna, get, I'm gonna show results that are getting closer and closer to the star. Okay, so at first, we basically can't see anything close to the star. All we can really see is the disk. Okay, so let's start off with a pretty famous debris disk. And uh, we heard in the introduction about Hubble, this image is actually from Hubble, and it used a chronograph in order to in order to block out the starlight because otherwise it would have been too hard to see this faint ring. Everyone sees the ring, right? Okay. So this was imaged um, back in 2008, and actually the authors imaged in multiple wavelengths, and so they were able to sort of make a low resolution spectrum. Is everyone familiar with what the term spectrum means, or no? Yes. Oh, okay. Well, if anyone has questions, just, just ask me. So basically, but this is just, you know, this is wavelength and flux. And so and the data for this disk is the black line. And here's a bunch of different models, okay? And um, you can see that basically the, a, a good fit is, is this red one, which turns out to be a solar system icy body, okay? An icy body, and we know that solar system bodies that are icy often have organics on them. And when we think about ice and organics, we think about life, because that's what we need and what we're made of. So if you're seeing something that looks like this around another star, then we're thinking, wow, maybe the ingredients for life exist around this star. And that'd be pretty exciting. The problem is um, you only have a, a, a little bit of wavelength coverage. You see it only goes out to about two microns. And so you, know, you have this exciting result come out and then shortly thereafter, you get another paper saying, well, actually, we can get a good fit to the data with just you know, a, little bit of, uh, a little bit of carbon, a little bit of water, uh, but not necessarily complex organics. Um, so that sort of you know, killed this idea. Um, but can we actually you know, distinguish between these two? Um, the answer is yes, by getting more data at longer wavelengths. So let me illustrate that. Here's Phoebe, one of uh, Saturn's icy moons. And um, here's the spectrum, okay? There's this huge feature, this huge absorption feature 
That's due to water ice. Um, and you also have two other little features at you know, 1.5 and around 2 microns. And um, what, what, what's the best fit for this, for, for PV, is actually tholins, which is a, it's complex organics, and water, and some, you know, some carbon. So this is, this is you know, a bona fide, exciting result, except it's in our solar system. It's not around another star. But um, the key is, you have this long wavelength coverage for the solar system. And you have to actually, turns out we have filters on, on telescopes that we use um, that can probe these wavelengths. In particular, there's two filters, a narrow band one we have, centered on three microns, and one longer called L prime, that's you know, from three to four microns. So if only we could take some data um, on, that, on that debris disk at these wavelengths, maybe we could actually see these features and, and extract the chemical composition. So that's what exactly what we tried to do. We took a whole bunch of images of this disk um, at Magellan with the adaptive optics system with both cameras at the same time. Here's 3.8, 3.3, 3.1, 2, all the way down. Actually, this is getting down to what your eyes can see, 0.77 microns. And uh, so here's our images, and they're, they're very pretty, but that's not what we use them for in the actual you know, publishing paper. We want to turn that into basically a spectrum. So here's the actual spectrum. Here's what we see. Here's that, remember this red slope again from before. And we have that same thing. But then we have this longer wavelength data, which fills in you know, what, what we were missing before. So what does this tell us about the dust? Well, we basically took everything that was in the literature um, to try to model the dust. We took a whole bunch of models of different compositions. You, know, you can think of these as kind of like silicates, which is you know basically um, <laughs> What, what uh, you know, dust uh, is is commonly assumed to be made of, you know, in, in around other stars. Um, we also have organics, complex organics, water, iron, and some other stuff that's often found in um, meteorites in, in the solar system. So we took things that uh, we both expect to find and may not expect to find, and we find the solar system stuff and try to model it. And we ran actually more than 8,400 unique mixtures of stuff to try to match what, uh, what the, the data had, the data shows. So here's a visual rep representation of what the best matches to the data were. So red is good, blue is bad, okay? And here's all the different compositions, and here's how much of each composition was in a particular mixture of dust. And you can see basically that um, silicates up here are favored in almost all cases. Water ice, not so much. And organics, things with carbon, often favored. Here's some other, changing some different assumptions, because there's a lots of free parameters. We want to make sure we check everything. You see the same general trends. Silicates favored, water ice not so much, organics favored. So silicates and amorphous carbon were mostly favored, not much water ice. That means that, at least from what we're seeing, the dust doesn't have much water ice. Don't panic about that, because there's a couple reasons we may not see water ice. One is, it's a, it, this dust is going around an A star. A stars are very hot, they have a lot of UV radiation. The dust um, that, that we're seeing, the water ice may be totally <coughs> obliterated um, pretty quickly as the dust is going around the star. So it may not, there may not be enough of it to actually see. It may not be long lasting enough. Another thing is, um, you can still have, you know, this dust comes from parent bodies that collide, big boulders that collide just randomly. You could still have water ice. Um, on those parent bodies, and they just, you know, when, they, when there's collisions, you just don't see them in the dust. The good thing is, though, there is a lot of carbon, and of course, we're carbon based life forms, so there's a lot of this stuff um, around this star. So, a little bit more about this disk. So, this is uh, an image again from Hubble, okay? You can see nicely resolved, um, there's, you know, a nice ring. Um, I just want to stress that <clears throat> this is what going to a bigger telescope on the ground that the adaptive optics does for you. You have a big primary mirror, your wavelength is comparable to in space, and so because D increased and lambda is the same, and adaptive optics allows you to hit the diffraction limit, you improve your resolution dramatically. So you can actually resolve you know, this fine, this narrow structure that you would not be able to see um, with HST. Even though Hubble's a great telescope, just doesn't have the resolving power that you can get from the ground with adaptive optics. And actually, so we can use our images to 
set constraints on how the ring is actually oriented in space around the star. So it turns out that the center of the ring is offset from the star. So the ring is eccentric, that has an eccentricity to it. And actually we can deproject it and sort of imagine what it would look like face on. And that's what this is. And this P and A, anyone guess what those stand for? Perihelion and aphelion? Yes, exactly, good job. Perihelion for astron. Perihelion, yeah, so it's helion for the, for the sun. Yes, you guys all got it. So we can actually uh, map out where the, the periastron and uh, apoastron are. And you know, this is where peri is, this is where apo is. Um, so, and then, and of course, there's the star, there's the center of the ring. So that's pretty neat, and hadn't been done before for this, for this uh, case. And, and by the way, so you see a ring-like offset eccentric uh, disk. What everyone thinks in the planet disk community is where are the planets that are making the ring look like that? Right, because if, if you got a, just a, a, a disk form around a star with no planets, why would it be eccentric? It should just be a nice circle, just like we have in the solar system, actually. Planets have a circle. So, um, yeah, so when you see it, this, you think planets. Where are they? And actually, we have lots of ring like disks. I, I shouldn't say lots, we have maybe five to ten. Uh, here's a, a bunch of different ones. Here's, again, the same one, 4796. <coughs> here's Small Mall. You guys heard of that one? Yeah. And of course, Small Mall B. Yes, okay, the planet. Okay, I won't get into that, but. Um, so you have a bunch of ring-like disks. Where are the planets? Um, that's what we'd like to know. And actually, so I'm an observer, but um, I had this idea that I wanted to basically try to predict um, what planets would be like um, around, you know, that, that, that shape rings, you know, by running simulations, numerical simulations. And so um, I, I, I basically did this a whole, like 160 times, a bunch of different disks, with planets of different masses, eccentricities, semi-major axis, different uh, ring parameters, to try to come up with a way to predict, you know, basically planet mass, planet mass based off of an observable, something you measure when you're when you're looking at the readings. And one thing you can measure is its width. So this just basically shows that the the, the bigger the planet shepherding the ring, the the wider the ring. So you can actually use this to come up with an equation. I spent a lot of time fitting this line. Everyone can do that here, I assume. And uh, come up with an equation. Um, and basically, this equation just takes in an observable, that's the width, and it spits out a planet mass. So this is something observers can use. Um, when they, you, you don't see the planet, you see the ring, you measure the width, plug it in, get a mass. So we can actually use this um, on, H, on HR 4796. So, uh, okay, so here's, here's some theoretical curves for what, basically, this is, you can think of this like brightness. So brightness is a function of distance. And so you can see like, you know, as you get a bigger, this is, again, just mass. You have a bigger mass, you have a wider disk. Here's what we actually saw with this disk. Now don't be fooled, these are actually, um, these are only, they, they, it looks like it's getting broader at different wavelengths. That's just due to the resolution, again, keyword resolution, changing. You know, as you get a longer wavelength, your resolution gets uh, worse, and so your, what you see gets broader. And so that's why the ring was broader. But we corrected for that, actually, when we, when we made these measurements, so the ring width. So the width, on average, is about 14%. So we can use this to constrain the mass of an unseen shepherding planet in this ring. So we plug this in, we get that the mass must be less than four Jupiter masses. We can go further. We can actually, using my, uh, my numerical predictions, we can actually say that it should be beyond 50 to 60 AU. Everyone knows what AU means, right? Yeah. Okay. And its eccentricity would be comparable to the ring, which is about 0.06. Um, okay, so we actually go this, we can go a little, little further with this and play some, some statistical games. So where does uh, an object spend most of its time on an orbit? Near Perry or Apple? Yeah. Apple. Apple. Exactly, right. So it's, it's going slower out here, faster over here, so it spends most of its time out here. So if there's a planet and it's absolutely aligned with the ring, meaning that they both share the same Perry and Apple astron, okay? They're both, they both share that, then the planet will spend most of its time near Apple astron, just like the ring. Just like the, most of the dust will spend most of its time here. Uh, relative to up here. So this is our deprojected image. We can actually take this and go back 
to our original image. And basically, this box is like this. So long story short, if there's a planet there, it's probably pretty close to the star right now and too hard to see. So we may have to wait a while for the planet to move out of the way. The next uh, topic, which again, so sort of now we're closing in a little closer to the star um, with, with the, the, the data and the techniques I'll show. So have you guys heard about radio velocity? The Doppler technique? So radio velocity is good at detecting planets that are close to their host stars. The, the stars themselves are old and quiet, meaning chromospherically quiet, but not like spewing out solar flares all the time, x-rays, they're just kind of sitting around, uh, kind of like our sun. They give you the minimum planet, planet mass when you detect something, you get m sine i, which is the minimum planet mass. You don't get the true planet mass. You also get the period and the eccentricity of the planet. When you directly image a planet, um, you're typically sensitive to things that are far away, longer period, because that you want to be far away from the star, and the star is bright light. You have to look at young stars because, this, as I said, planets cool over time, and so uh, you want to look at planets when they're very young, and so therefore their host stars sh should be young. You get a model dependent true mass because you 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 don't you, all you're seeing is light, right? So you have to sort of come up with a, an evolutionary model based on you know some predictions about how atmospheres cool and contract and things like that come up with a mass. And actually, as with beta pic, when you saw the planet go around the star, you know, theoretically, with enough images, enough time, you can get all the orbital elements of an object. You get the full astrometry, which is really powerful. Now, it turns out that, as you can see, these fill in sort of opposite and complementary areas. And so radio velocity and direct imaging are pretty complementary. So here's some radio velocity data from a paper from a few years ago. This is radio velocity versus time. And this is again, so you're looking at a star here, and you see that basically <coughs> there's a linear trend here over time. So the velocity is changing like this. And so this group, they said, hmm, there's, there could be something big tugging on the star with, on a really long orbit. Let's try to image it with adaptive optics. And so they did. They used Keck. You guys have heard of Keck? Yes. Keck has its own adaptive optics. Different from um, Magellan. They use a, a not adaptive secondary. They use a small, tiny little adaptive mirror that's way down in the, off, in the light path. Still really good, just a different approach. Um, and so you see here, there's that little object. And so this object is responsible for this trend. And actually, the name of their program is called the Trends High Contrast Imaging Program. It's an acronym. Everyone has acronyms. <laughs> I do too, actually. You'll, you'll see. Um, <clears throat> now, back when I was a graduate student, uh, I actually had the same idea. Um, and I, so I looked at a, another star that had an interesting trend. This is actual curvature here. So it's not just a linear trend, but actual curvature. So that gives us more information about what the object might be. And so I was hoping that we might detect something. Turns out we didn't really detect anything at all. No. That's OK, though. In astronomy, Null results are still very powerful. And so we actually were able to provide a lot of constraints on what this object could be tugging on the star. So we said it basically had to be less than 40 Jupiter masses within 25 AU. Otherwise, we would have detected it. That makes sense. So here's my, my acronym for my program. So I'm doing MAGAO Imaging of Long Period Objects, MILO. Happens to be the name of my cat. Just coincidence. <laughs> um, so basically, this is a collaboration with Paul Butler. You guys heard of him? Kind of like the grandfather of radio velocity exoplanets. He's at he's a couple offices down from my from where I am at Carnegie. And so he had all this R, he has he has all this RV data. I have all this imaging time. And so I said, give me your long term trends. I demanded them. No, no, it was very friendly. <laughs> and he he said, sure, let's do this. <clears throat> so we have all this imaging data from a bunch of different instruments. Or this RV data. 50 targets with long-term trends. And so a couple years ago, I started this. Imaged about 15 stars so far, and we already have many new companions. And I'll show you one really interesting one right now. So this is HD7449. It's a sun-like star, old, quiet, same deal. Uh, this is, I think it's an F9. Are you guys familiar with the sequence? OK, so it's like a, you know, a little hotter than, than uh, our sun. It has one planet, and actually, <clears throat> It's very eccentric. This is its phased orbit. 
You can see it's really eccentric. It's not a nice sine curve like you often see for radio velocity detected planets. It's, a, it's an ugly eccentric orbit. It's about 0.8, actually. So it's, it's pushing the limit of, of being bound. Um, and then there's this longer, longer term trend. And the authors that published this planet actually said, well, this is most likely a planet. You know, they, 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 they ran a whole bunch of different fits and, and came up, you know, uh, basically statistically said the most likely, the most probable uh, solution is, is, is a planet, you know, around 8, 9, maybe. Um, we were suspicious of that, so we said, let's, let's image the system and see if it's something bigger further out. Um, so here's what we found. We took a bunch of pictures at different wavelengths. Again, same deals with uh, that disk, from visible to the infrared. And you see, there's a little dot there in every single image. And actually, do you guys notice that the size of the object is changing? That's because the resolution is changing. Wavelength is getting longer, the diameter is staying the same. Um, this object is located about half an arc second. And uh, so here's the star. The star here, there's no chronograph. It's just, that's me just putting in a little digital mask afterwards. Um, you know, and the image is basically just to enhance the contrast just for display purposes, basically. So you guys can see the little object. And we, I didn't have to do any fancy data reduction to pull this out. This was actually seen <coughs> um, right at the telescope by the, actually the person, so there's two cameras, and it's, it's pretty difficult to operate both cameras with both my hands at the same time, so usually there's one person doing one. The person that was operating the visible camera said, I think we have something here uh, right away. Um, and uh, so there it is. All right, so what is this thing? Well, first of all, it's likely to be bound to the star. So you often do get background objects, you know, distant stars that just happen to be in your field of view when you're looking at a star. This thing, it, it, we actually imaged it two weeks apart at the telescope. So here's the, uh, yeah, here's the first night, the average of the first night. Here's the average of the second night. And if it were a background star, it would have gone from here to there. Instead, it went from here to there. So this basically shows <coughs> that this is likely to be uh, a bad <coughs> object for the star. That's good. Next thing is, what does it look like? What other objects are similar to it? And so because we have a visible and infrared camera, we can basically get a full SED, spectral energy, energy distribution. Are you guys are familiar with that term? Some of you maybe? Anyway, it's just basically just means, you know, what's the energy of the object as a function of wavelength? What does it look like? And it turns out we have a, whole, a bunch of comparison objects. These are M stars of different types, M2, and 45 and 6 And our black is our object that we discovered. And you see it's pretty similar to this M4.5. <coughs> so from our photometry, from our images alone, this looks like an M4 at around half an arc second, which is at the distance to this star, it's about 20 AU. So you have a star, a planet at 2.3 AU, it's very eccentric, and an M dwarf at around 20 AU. We're not done there. There's still more that we can do. And that's because of we have this radio velocity data also. Based on our radio velocity analysis, we can we can we have our imaging, we can set that aside and go full force into the radio velocity data that we have and run a whole bunch of different, we can do a Markov chain, Monte Carlo, MCMC, maybe you've heard of it, maybe not. Anyway, it's just basically a fancy way of saying we're running a whole bunch of different fits um, and coming up with, you know, basically uh, what, what looks like the best fit. And here's, here's mass, here's period, and you can see that, you know, we, this doesn't give us an exact number, an exact solution, it just gives us a distribution of likely values. And you can see that this the mass is likely to be around 0.2 solar masses. So that's 20% of the mass of our sun. It's a little tiny dwarf star. And its period is likely to be <clears throat> on the order of you know, 50 to 100 years. OK, so we're not done there. Because actually, we can get some interesting constraints on the planet. Now, the planet, I said, is very eccentric. And this M dwarf is pretty close. Have you guys ever heard of the Kozai mechanism? Kazai cycles? No? OK. So just briefly, <clears throat> Kazai cycles are basically when you have a star, a planet, and some other objects, a massive object. And if they're not all in the same plane initially, orbiting the same plane, if they're misaligned, then you can get the, the planet and the outer object. They basically exchange 
angular momentum, and that causes the eccentricity and inclination of the planet to oscillate back and forth over time in very big extremes. And so what's likely going on here in this case is you have Kozai cycles. So this planet is very eccentric right now, but in a few thousand years, you know, 10,000 years, its eccentricity will drop, and its inclination, as the eccentricity is dropping, will increase, and so it'll, it'll become misaligned. And then that'll repeat back and forth over time for a long, long time. And so if that's true, then we know, if, if, that, if that's what's really going on, then the, 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 uh, the inclination between these two, the delta inclination between the M dwarf and the planet, has to be bigger than about 40 degrees. And we know from our data, from our radio velocity data, that the inclination of this M dwarf has to be bigger than 9 degrees. So we can actually solve or get a constraint for the inclination of the planet. And of course, the inclination of the planet is key because with radio velocity, you only get M psi naught. You're, you have this inclination degeneracy. So we know then that the planet's inclination must be bigger than 48 degrees. If we plug that into m psi i, and we get the planet's mass must be less than 1.5 Jupiter masses. So we have a, a real tight constraint on the mass of the planet around another star. And that's rare. You don't, you don't have that a lot um, when we study planets. OK, just a little background. Where do planets live? These are all the planets that have been detected by rate of velocity transits. Here's the ones by imaging, taking pictures. You see, we have a ways to catch up. <laughs> but I'll, I'll, show, I'll show the work that I've done is going to help us do that. Uh, here's just for reference. This is Jupiter and Saturn. Here's a survey. Remember I mentioned back in the day, about, I mean, earlier in the talk, about how imaging surveys have not really found any planets. Um, and here's basically, here's why. So the, this is the, everything in the blue is what this survey could have detected. And you see that basically in terms of mass and some major axis, that's like, you know, 100 AU is where they could have detected objects. Our solar system, everything's orbiting within 30 AU. So if we're looking for solar system analogs, it, it, we're not going to find them this way. So ideally, we want to get in closer to the star. That's the goal. All right, here's the actual answer to how, how the most dominant common method for detecting planets right now from the ground. This is how we do it. Angular differential imaging, also known as ADI. Um, so basically, you have your star. These are not stars. They're just little diffraction uh, aberrations. Speckles is what they're often referred to as. And you, you get them in your images. And they, unfortunately, they look just like planets, because planets are just basically the same thing as a star, just fainter. So you have a whole bunch of stuff that looks like crap, and you have to disentangle a planet from, from crap. Um, and it's, it's, it's really out of what we have to do. So the way we do this is basically we turn off the instrument rotator. So the thing that normally is rotating with the sky so that everything's nicely aligned, we turn that off. When that happens, the planet moves throughout throughout the observations. And this is, by the way, idealistic, right? So this assumes that the speckles stay the same. But when they're, if they're changing, then the median image is going to have these speckles in different spots. And so then when you difference them like this, they're not going to line up perfectly. But for the sake of this cartoon, you can see that this is ideally how it would work. So when you subtract them, you get a whole bunch of images where not, you have nothing but the planet in different spots. You rotate the planet back to one spot, Take an average, sum it up, whatever you want to do, and there's your planet. That's theoretically how it works. And this is HRX 799, that, uh, that planetary system with four planets that I showed in the very beginning. That's this. Okay, and here's, <clears throat> here's those four planets again. Notice these dark streaks next, next to uh, the planets. Those are the problem with ADI. That's the result of, of basically the, the light of the planet subtracting from itself. When you take that median image, there's still some planet light in there. So when you subtract it from all the other images, you're pulling away some of the planet flux. And so your planet's going to be fainter than you would like. Um, so that's a bad thing. Also, by the way, this is the scale here, so points you like to Also, you can say that this, this, is, this area here is called the speckle floor. It's basically where you can't really see closer in, because the speckles are, the residuals are just too dominant. And uh, unfortunately, inside of here, 
is where all the fun stuff is happening. This is where all <laughs> the solar system scale stuff is happening. And that's what we really care about. This is great, but we want to get closer. OK, so the problem is just a review. Planet flux self subtraction time. Time's a problem because the speckles don't stay the same. <coughs> Solutions. A reference PSF. PSF means point spread function, just means like an image. So a reference star that doesn't contain any planet flux. That'd be great, because then we don't lose any light from the planet itself. So if we observe two stars at the same time on the detector, what does that, what does that give us? Here's a little cartoon to show you. So here's space, two stars, one has a planet. Here's another star located some distance away. Here's our atmosphere. Light comes down. Here we are on Earth. If we look at these two stars, and they're close enough to each other, then they're going to look the same, even with adaptive optics off. They're going to look exactly the same if they're within this thing called the isoplanetic patch. If we look at this star <clears throat> over here, it looks different because it's in a different, it's coming from a different patch of atmosphere. So if we take this star and subtract from this one, we're going to see junk. If you subtract these two from each other, then theoretically, if this is a planet, you could see it. If you could see the planet at all, it's bright. Okay, so basically two stars look identical if they're within the isoplanetic patch. And that, is, that size of, that, of this patch changes with wavelength. It generally gets bigger as you go to longer wavelengths. Okay. So at Magellan, the telescope that I use, Magio, um, I was testing this idea, and I'll show you a movie here. This is with the adaptive optics off, okay? And it's actually more instructive for you to see that this actually works. And so here's your two stars. <clears throat> Ignore this, it's just from the sky subtraction. It's one of the stars. It's a negative image of the star. But watch, you'll see these two stars change over time. Notice how they change identically. That's because they're within the isoplanetic patch at this wavelength. So if we turn on adaptive optics, it'll only get better. So this, what I'm calling this technique is binary differential imaging, because the, the, what we use are binaries, visual binaries, to do this. That's basically nature's homegrown solution. We need stars that are close enough together that they are within the isoplanetic patch, so that they, they look identical, and we can do this subtraction. Here's with the dominant way of doing things, the EDI, that old way of, of doing it. You can see there's those, those negative patches next to, the, next to the planet. That's from the self-subtraction. Here's with the new method. You see that it doesn't have any of those negative patches because there was no planet in the reference image, right? <coughs> um, and so this is just signal noise here. You can see it's basically double signal noise. And this is pretty close to the star in both cases. Uh, of course, we don't want to just you know one, run uh, one test and call it a day. We do it 10,000 times, different, ra different brightnesses, random brightnesses, random locations, and come up with a statistical, you know, distribution of how the technique really works. And so <clears throat> green here is the old way, blue is the new way. And you can see that basically this is contrast, which is how faint of an object could we have detected versus separation. And you can see that the new method detects fainter planets closer to the star. So that's, that's the whole point of this, is to get closer in to solar system scales. And this technique does that. Finally, moving very close in now to the star. So this is um, this is a star called HD 142527. It's it's kind of similar to what you might think of of the infant solar system. It has a, a big spiral. You see the spirals, disc here that has both dust and gas. You know, when it gets older, it'll lose that gas, but there's still gas there. You have some gas in this gap, even even though there's no dust, you still have some gas there. And uh, there's those spirals. But I want you to pay very close attention in here, really close to the star, because something interesting is going on there. What's going on here? <clears throat> Ignore the, uh, you know, there's no units here, because this is, this is a kind of like a probability map uh, that was made with interferometry. But basically, there's something very close, uh, 88 milliseconds right there. And actually, with Maggie O, we took a picture of it. And actually, we took a picture of it at the H alpha wavelength. Everyone know what wavelength that is? Yes. Yeah, so, and, uh, and actually we took in that wavelength and outside in the continuum. And there's that little object right there. 
And if you're seeing it in H alpha, that means that it's accreting. It's accreting gas from the nearby environment. And this thing, unfortunately, it's not a plant, but it's, it's, it's a little embryo. But this technique cannot be done anywhere else as, uh, right now. You can only do this at MAGAO. And you can image at H alpha, and you can detect young accreting objects. Um, young growing objects for the first time. Let's take this technique and apply it to some other stars. Here's the calcium 15. You guys heard of this one? Maybe? No. Okay. So a couple years ago, it was uh, imaged um, using, a, again, interferometry. Uh, it's called non redundant masking. It's, it's a complicated technique that I don't know that much about. But basically, they saw these structures. They looked like kind of like two point sources, maybe one, maybe a third there. Look at the scale here. 11 AU. This is inside Saturn's orbit. Okay, so this is very close to the solid. So we look at this with MAGAO at H alpha. Here's what we saw: in H alpha, something there. In the continuum, nothing. When we subtract the two, boom, something very bright. So that tells us that there's an object. It turns out it's one of those objects in the previous picture. One of these has moved, and it's now down here, and it's accreting. So we are detecting a planet growing for the first time. And this was published <coughs> in Nature. He was that excited, believe it or not. Um, so this is pretty cool. And actually, just to give you an idea of the scale here, so here there's a big disk around this star. And again, because planets and disks, they're, they go hand in hand. Um, here's your disk. Here's the scale bar, 50 AU. Way inside, you have actually two point sources. This is the, this, here's a zoom in here. This is the one that was detected in H alpha, the growing one. Here's one that was, a new one that was detected with non-redundant masking, that, this interferometry technique. So this one's, this one's accreting, this one not. Maybe something there, although I'm skeptical of that. But two bright point sources, right there. And actually, based on the orientation of this disk, we can actually fit some orbits. And it looks like, based on the orbital motion, this is what we have here. This one is here, going around like this. And then you have C going around a little further out. Look again, look at the scale here, 10 AU. So we're really probing close in to a star, an infant solar system for the first time. It's very exciting. So adaptive optics allows us to resolve Saturn dust rings. And so it allows us to see a ring, a debris disk, in really sharp detail for, um, which we can't do from space, at least not yet. We can constrain dust grain compositions, the chemical compositions of dust around other stars, which has implications for you know, life. Um, we can also detect self-luminous companions, stars, uh, and even young growing plants for the first time. And in general, exoplanets and disks is a, it's a very young field. It's hot right now. Each new discovery um, an image changes the way we think about you know, exoplanets and our place in the universe.